thank you so much for tuning in. I invite you to turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 15, and that'll be the main text for our study today. Luke chapter 15. Charles Dickens once said that Luke chapter 15 holds the greatest stories ever told. He may be right about that. Some of the most notable parables of our Lord are really contained in this chapter. The story of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. These are stories that are, that are very recognizable to us. And, and parables had, had a very special role in Jesus' ministry. Not only were they practical, something that the people could relate to, but they were also very persuasive. They had very strong messages and content found within each of the stories. In Luke chapter 15, we see, we, we see the longest parable Jesus ever told. That is the prodigal son. And it's likely the first thing that comes to mind when, when we think of this chapter. But Luke chapter 15 is not about the prodigal son. Luke chapter 15 isn't about repentance. It's not about forgiveness even. But I propose to you that it is about Jesus' interest in people. Jesus cared about people. Jesus had an interest in each person that he came into contact with. The way we know that this chapter is about Jesus' interest in people is because of the first two verses. And if we don't understand the first two verses of Luke chapter 15, I don't think that we're going to understand the true significance of this parable and this story and this chapter in our lives. Let's read verses 1 through 2 together and let's set the stage as we study this chapter. The Bible reads, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. Previous to this chapter, Jesus has talked about the, the cost of discipleship and the importance of integrity in every person's life. And he highlights the need of the savor that salt has in chapter 14. But verse 1 begins with a contraction in the Greek. Day in the Greek means now, then, or, or therefore. So what this does is, the things that have been said in the previous chapter, it ties those things now to what Jesus is saying. Jesus has just delivered a message about counting the cost. Now, the tax collectors and the sinners come to hear him. Jesus just delivered a message of selflessness to a selfish people. But yet, these people came to hear Jesus' words. Well, why would they hear Jesus' words? Jesus has just broken down really all that they stand for. The tax collectors and the scribes, the, the Pharisees, these are all people who are living lives that, that are not godly. They're living lives that are not honest. They're living lives full of deceit and, and, and trouble. But yet they came to hear Jesus after he had told them these things. Well, why is that? I want to propose to you that it's because they saw that Jesus had an interest in them. Jesus was willing to sit down and to talk with them. Jesus is not praised for his teachings, though. Um, rather, he's ridiculed by the Pharisees. Um, Jesus, Jesus was willing to sit down with people who were outcast of society. The Pharisees say, Jesus, what are you doing? Why are you acting this way? Why are you hanging around these people? But because Jesus had an interest in people, he decided they needed to be talked to as well. If Jesus was willing to sit and talk with people who were not like you and I, who had issues, who were outcast of society, if Jesus was willing to talk to those people, what does that mean in my life? Am I sitting down and talking with people I might not have things in common with? Am I telling them, I care about you. I want you to be saved. I want you to come to a knowledge of the truth that Paul tells Timothy, God wants all men to have. We've got to make sure that we're having the correct attitude. We've got to make sure that we're having our priorities in check when it comes to talking with people. Because if we don't, well, we're lacking one of the very, very visual traits that Jesus had when it came to talking with people. Jesus had an interest in people. The reason Jesus tells these parables is because he's trying to teach the Pharisees and he's trying to teach you and me that we've got to have an interest in people. The Pharisees said, this man receives sinners and eats with them. And then in verse 3, Jesus says, then he told them this parable. Jesus follows ridicule up with a reason for why 
they needed to have an interest in people. I want you to read verses 3 through 7 in me. Jesus was interested because people were lost, number one. Verse 3 begins saying, So he told them this parable. What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he's found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you that there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Notice something in verse 4. Notice that, that de the determination that's seen in how this person goes out and seeks the sheep. He goes into the far country. These sheep had, had wandered away. He goes into the country to find these people because he care to find the sheep because he cares about this sheep. The sheep doesn't it isn't just in the next pasture. It's not just next door. He's got to have determination to go out and seek those people, those sheep. In verse 5, notice that the Bible doesn't say if he finds it. Rather, the Bible says when he finds it. I think this is noting the determination that, that this person has to find the sheep in the open country. The shepherd had an interest in the sheep, and he was going to search until he find it. But here's the reality, folks. There are too many little Bo Peep Christians in our world and in the church. So many people have the ideology of little Bo Peep has lost her sheep and doesn't know where to find them. Leave them alone. They'll come home wagging their tails behind them. This isn't the message that Jesus is trying to tell us. Jesus is, is, is showing us an example that we've got to have determination in seeking people, having an interest in people, because people are lost. There are so many people who are lost today. And if you and I aren't willing to go out and search for those people, well, they're never going to find uh, the truth anyway. We have a proper interest in people. We cannot have a little Bo Peep mindset. We can learn from, from this section that we will have to go the extra mile to save sinners. It may not be easy. We may have to go far out of our way. But we, if we have an interest like Jesus does in people, well, we're going to make that extra step. We're going to go into the far country. We're going to search in the wilderness for that sheep and bring it back. Have you ever tried to, to bring back an animal that didn't want to come home? Maybe you have a dog and you walk in that dog one day and you had decided that, that it was time to go home. We had walked enough. And that dog did not want to go home. Well, you're pulling at that, that leash. You're pulling at that dog to get home. And that many times doesn't work. We've got to be determined to, to pick up the sheep, lay it on our shoulders, and take it back home. We've got to be willing to interact with people in a way that's consistent with Christianity, but that's also in a comfortable way for them. We've got to be reasonable with people. We've got to be easygoing with people. And we're going to have to have determination to seek and save the lost if we have an interest in people like Jesus. But I want you to notice a second story that Jesus tells. Jesus was interested in people also, not only because they were lost, but number two, because people had value. And that's the story of the lost coin. It's the shortest, it's the shortest parable of this section, but nonetheless, it still holds a lot of significance. Read verses 8 through 10 with me. Or what woman having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she's found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. What's the most valuable thing you own? Maybe it's a precious heirloom. Maybe it's something that your family's handed down to you. What would your reaction be if that was lost? Because that's, that's I think, what the picture Jesus is trying to, to place in our minds. We have something that's valuable. Our reaction when it's lost is panicking. It, history tells us that, that the coins that, that this woman had were likely an adornment that a husband would give his wife. Um, he would give her ten coins, likely. And, and ten coins would either be worn around, um, around the forehead, maybe around the neck, or even around the waist. So when this woman walked around town, all the other people looked at this woman and saw how much her husband loved her by the amount of coins she had. So if we consider this idea of a woman losing a coin, 
She loses it off the center of her, maybe she just loses one coin. Everything's out of place at that point. She wasn't as fit as she was before. She didn't look as good as she could have because she lost this coin. And this coin was something that was valuable to her. Within these few verses, we see what I think is the value of a lost soul. We're talking about Jesus' interest in people. You've got to tie it back to verses 1 through 2. That lost sheep in the first story, well, that's a sinner. In this story, this coin, I think, is, is the same idea. It's someone who is lost, someone who is valuable. But notice the value of the coin is so great that she sweeps the house, she lights a candle, and she searches until it's found. Very similar to the diligence and, and the determination that was seen in the first story. But once it's found, it's not just a sigh of relief. It's not just... Oh, I guess we found the coin now I can go on about my life. No, it's a time of rejoicing. A time where, where she gathers together her family saying, Look what I found. Look what I, I, I've, I've got now. And, and I love verse 10 of the, this, this chapter because it tells us about um, what our reaction should be when what is lost is found. It says there's, there's rejoicing in the presence of angels over one sinner who repents. I don't want to judge every congregation by this, but I know I've been in congregations where someone comes forward, sit on the front pew, they say, I've sinned, I've, I've been lost, I want to come to the Lord. And when that person is restored, the majority of the congregation walks out the back door without saying a word. Well, I think that if we're trying to be like those in the heavenly places, if we're trying to be like those who set an example for us, when that thing is lost, when that person is lost, when that soul is restored, it's a time for rejoicing. It's not a time for neglect. It's not a time for disregard. When that person comes forward, we need to be coming to them saying, I'm so glad you're back. I'm so glad you're now found. I'm so excited that you decided to make your life right. We need to make sure that we see the value in people. Because if we value people like we should, that's not a problem. Going and hugging their neck, telling them I'm praying for you. We need to have... Uh, val we need to see our value that we, that people have. And if we don't have an interest in people, we don't have the love for them that I think we should have, and definitely not the love that Jesus had. Jesus was interested, number three, in people because people needed to come home. Not only were there some who were lost, not only were there people who had value, but nonetheless, people also needed to come home. And this is the last parable that Jesus tells in this chapter, and it's found in verses 20 through 31. And I want us to read that. It's a lengthy section, but just to paint the picture, and we'll make some notes after we read it. Um, so the beginning of the story, a uh, son comes to his father, and he says, Father, I want you to give me what's due at the end of my life. I want you to give me all of the money that, that was supposed to be my inheritance, and I want it now. And he takes this and he goes off into the far country where he wastes it on what the Bible says, I think the King James says, riotous living. And so we get to chapter, uh, should we get to verse 20? And we see, we see a, very, a very big change in his life as from when he first started out on this journey into the far country. As a matter of fact, I want to start in verse 17. Because leading up to verse 17, he finds himself in the pig pen because no man would give him anything. And he realizes the bread and despair that his father had in his house. He realized that it was time to come home. He realized that it was time to get right. And in verse 16, or in verse 17, let's begin reading there, and we'll make some points afterwards. When he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I'll say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fatted calf. And kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. 
He called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father's killed the fatted calf because he's received him back safe and sound. But he was angry, and he refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, and his fa he answered his father, Look, these many years I've served you, and I've never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat. You never did anything for me when I, when I went to wanted to celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came who's devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him? He said to him, Son, you're always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad. For this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. Perhaps this is the most recognizable part of this story. And I think that if we we're building upon what we found in verses 1 through 2 and in the other stories, we're going to see an interest in people once again. And here we see a father's interest in his son and things surrounding his son. We see a father's interest in the reception of his son. The father receives the son as he comes back home with open arms, kissing him. I imagine, and this may be just, just me, but I imagine the father, as this son is away in the far country, we're not giving a time, given a time stamp of how long he's been in the country. And I imagine the father looking down the driveway, hoping to see his son walking back up day by day. There's no communication between the father and the son, so I imagine the father wondering, when is my son coming back home? When is he going to come back to me? And I view him just looking down the end of that driveway each and every day, longing to see his son. So when his son decides to come home, when his son decides to get right, he receives him with open arms, rejoicing. Do we care for people? Do we have an interest in people like this father did his son? When we see someone who's been broken, who's been destroyed in their life, and they want to get right, do we receive them with open arms? Do we have a relationship with, with people where they know when they mess up, they can come to us for help? We're Christians. We have the answer for all of their problems. We've got to have an interest in people to receive them when they come back. We've also got to have a relationship with them to where they want to come back to us. But I think we see something else in this in this section, we see a father's interest about rejection. Notice that at the end of the story, the father addresses his son. The son was in the field and would not go in when there was rejoicing. And I think what this is painting a picture of is what we saw in the very beginning verses. The Pharisees said, this man receives and eats with sinners. I don't want, the Pharisees didn't want anything to do with these people, and they were condemning Jesus for, for having that interest in them. But here we see the older brother who will not go in to that which was lost, to that which had been an outcast of society, he would not have a relationship with him. Notice he even says, um, this, this your son, your, your son came back. It's not my brother, it, it's your son, that's on you. But the father cares so much about his sons that he even goes out, and I think the ASV, ASV says, he entreated him about these things. He went and investigated why his son was acting like this. And we see a son who's, who's very prideful and boast, boastful about himself. I've never done any things. I've, 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 ne I've obeyed you all my life, and, and you've not given me anything. But the father says, do you recognize what's going on here? Your brother was lost. Your brother was dead, and now he's alive and found. And you're out here in the, in the field, not coming in? That was the Pharisees. And Jesus is warning us that we should not be that older brother. But we see a father's interest in another way. We see it when it comes to rejoicing, not only in reception and rejection, but also rejoicing. As the sons received, a son who's wasted his money with harlots, with prostitutes, the father brings him the very best. Father says, bring the robe, bring the ring, bring the shoes, kill the fatted calf. This was such a wonderful time for his family because his son was back. 
if, a, if this father didn't have an interest in his son, if he had cut all care and love for this son, when this son comes back, he's not doing these things. But because this father was interested in the well-being of his son, when his son comes back, it's time for rejoicing. It's time for great celebration. And tying that back to verse 10, there's great rejoicing in the presence of angels when one sinner repents. We see that again in this chapter and in this verse. Once the son returns, he's given the best of the household. Just as those who found the lost coin, the father and the servants rejoice because what was lost was found. Do we, are we glad when souls are added to the kingdom, when people are restored, when people come back home? If we have an interest like our Lord did in people, well, the potential of the church is, is unlimited. If we can see, see people as souls who need a Savior, soul a Savior thou art needing, as we sing sometimes, we're going to be more effective as Christians. We're going to be more pleasing to God. If we don't have an interest in people, we're disregarding the ministry of Jesus. If we don't have an interest in people, we're neglecting important duties that we have as Christians. We don't have an interest in people. We're not going to be pleasing to God. I hope that as we've studied this chapter that you see that it's necessary to have an interest in people. It doesn't matter where they come from. It doesn't matter what situation they're in. People matter. And if we can see that people matter and souls matter, we're going to make a very positive impact on a very dark and troubled world. We want to expand the borders of the kingdom. If we want to bring more souls to Christ, we're going to have to have an interest in people. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you all are doing well and have a good rest of the week.